Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first in the series of the uh, UKRI Net Zero seminars or webinars. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here um, this morning, um, and I'm delighted to be uh, joined by our panellists as well, who we'll be hearing from um, shortly. So just by way of introduction, my name is Melanie Wellam. I'm the Executive Chair of the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council, BBSRC, which is part of UK Research and Innovation. And in my role, um, I sort of have oversight or sort of sponsorship of a number of programmes which are looking to um, the future around sustainable food production. Um, so it's, it's a real pleasure for me to be hosting um, the first in this webinar series um, today um, with that focus of um, sustainable food. Um, the Net Zero series of webinars is really seeking to sort of shed light on the work that UK Research and Innovation is supporting um, as part of its flagship industrial strategy challenge fund programme, where it's looking to find solutions to challenges and clearly there are opportunities within that. Um, for the UK to really move towards that greener future and, and to build that, that greener future. And, and clearly sustainable food is a really important element of that. Um, so that's our focus for this first webinar. Um, and I think all of us recognise the um, challenge we're facing around climate change. And I'm sure many of you, like I uh, was yesterday evening, watched um, the first in the, the series um, that Greta Thunberg was, was hosting um, around sort of a year for change. Um, and food production um, is actually, and our current traditional agricultural production systems contribute significantly to greenhouse gas emissions up to 30% um, in some parts of the world, although it's lower in, in the UK. And as part of that greenhouse gas emissions, there are also broader um, pollution issues associated with our traditional um, systems. Um, not only that, but, but agriculture is driving um, change, is habitat loss, and that's driving biodiversity loss in some parts of the world as well. So there are these dual um, aspects that we need to consider when we're thinking about how we can produce food sustainably for a growing population. So really what we're going to be thinking about today is thinking about how can some of the technological advances, the connectivity that we have today, how can that actually change our food systems? Um, how can new technologies contribute to a more sustainable, uh, more, a more efficient food production system, which generates less weight? waste but nonetheless produces food which is not only affordable that people want to eat but is also um, nutritious. So today I think we'll hear from um, our six speakers about a range of approaches um, that are being developed that seek to tackle um, some of these um, very issues all under that framing of, of moving towards sort of sustainable food. So we'll be hearing things um, including algae as a production um, platform um, for food, um, about the use of robotic and autonomous systems, um, insects as potential um, alternatives, upcycling of organic waste through the use, um, um, through in insect revolution, as we might call it, um, thinking about how we can use controlled environments, vertical farms, um, new technologies such as aeroponic technologies, um, in terms of food production and also thinking about the plastics challenge as well and how that relates um, to making food more sustainable in the future. We are going to have a question and answer session after all of the presentations, which is going to be really important. And can I please ask that you pop your questions as they come up and we will go through them. Um, either when someone is presenting or towards the end, we'll capture those, put them in the Q&A function there, and then we'll come to those. Um, we have a, a good period of time um, after the presentations to have a panel discussion. So I really encourage you to think about that. So I'm now going to introduce um, the first speaker, who is Raphael Jovin, who is the founder and chief scientist of Sisiwi. Over to you, Raphael. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you for having me. Um, I cannot share my, ah, there it is. It's coming, I'm sharing my screen. All right, excellent. 
So I'm Raphael Jovin, I'm the founder of Suseiwi. Um, we're working with this dream team from the Scottish Association of Marine Sciences who are doing an upwelling model at our production site in Morocco of the ocean. University of Southampton that's reducing the energy demand for all of our sort of activities and production. We've also got two subcontractors, uh, Environment Systems, um, that is doing satellite work. Our ponds are large enough that we can look into them with satellites and Business Science Corporation that's doing a digital twin. Uh, all of this is in the uh, ISCF Future Foods Production Systems context. And it's been a very challenging, but really fun program. And what we do is why we are here is make the soup on the right, basically. Innovate UK has been very helpful in getting us to this point, but our algae are very rich in uh, protein and have excellent usable lipids. And the whole system is very different. It's a nature-based solution where we replicate natural algal blooms that happen in the ocean on land. These blooms in nature are seasonal and we figured out how to do this year round using the sort of local resources with local organisms. Um, it's, a, uh, it's very different because in these blooms, algae grow exponentially and can outcompete everything, competitors, predators, um, even diseases. And they grow fast enough so you get a really rich, high uh, net productivity. Now, all of this takes CO2 from the air and the seawater. We deacidify enormous amounts of seawater, uh, the nutrients from the seawater and the sun. Hence, our name the, for the company name Suseiwi stands for sun, sea, wind. Um, okay. Um, so the, uh, the way we work is this the uh, we take deep sea water, we pump it to the surface, we seed it with local algae that are acclimated to those conditions. Uh, then we grow them up in a very clean controlled environment till they're ready to go outside. And then we work with them in outdoor ponds that are, um, that are filled with natural seawater. They grow exponentially as we're doing it. And we figured out a whole lot of low cost ways of harvesting and processing the algae. So that uh, taking, for example, mining uh, industry technology and all of this already today is powered by renewable energy. Um, what is special about this, I mean, this is truly in the desert. We are in the proper Sahara. We have 6,100 hectares of land in Morocco, 3,200 hectares of land in, in uh, Oman, which are in salt pans where you couldn't grow a blade of grass. Now, growing algae in this sort of new way uh, and is, is a truly additive net primary productivity in the sense that um, we make food from uh, where you couldn't grow anything before that wouldn't have happened otherwise. So it's truly new production. Uh, now what AgriSat does is, is if you look at the bottom right here, we do sort of, these are the canaries and this is the Moroccan coastline. We're doing uh, regional, very high resolution modeling to understand the oceanography. We're looking into our ponds with satellites so that we can really uh, sort of see the color and the quality of the ponds. Um, we combine this on the top right here with sort of molecular understanding of how our cells are photosynthesizing and they're very efficient in this state, uh, growing very rapidly and using the sunlight very efficiently. And then translate that into a telecommand system where we actually instruct the ponds uh, to operate mostly independently based on all these external conditions. And it contains uh, lots of control points that we can read from these other factors. Now, all of that information is flowing into uh, our next generation. This picture here is an engineering drawing of one of our first, um, of our first production modules. For example, in Morocco, we're going to gang 43 of these modules together. Um, and all that information is already being used to design and improve these ponds and this whole operation so that we can get maximum production out of it. Again, uh, we've, we're rich in protein, rich in fatty acids. 
But the other thing is we are working very much on the product development side to figure out how to turn this into food. Um, and what has emerged is this, that we can bury about 18% of the biomass that we create at very low cost, which turns this not just into a net zero food production, but even including the transport costs from Morocco to uh, the UK and actually processing it in the UK, even including that we can be net negative and actually remove carbon. And the whole point of doing this is, is, uh, is to make food. So we've got on the top right here, no fish fingers. These are demonstration products for investors to see how to use our protein, for example. Um, we've got these sea crackers, uh, which are quite yummy. And we make things like vegan caviar. Now we are not a product uh, and retail company, but these are illustration products that we've already made that have been very well received. Um, and uh, that you can make with these compounds. The uh, point is, is uh, I'll leave you some extra time. Uh, thank you very much for uh, being here. Thank you to the other panelists. I'm really excited to hear the other presentations and thank you Innovate UK. Uh, I'll stop sharing now. And if you have some questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Raphael, for starting us off with that, that really interesting. I, I've already got lots of questions, but it's not for me to ask the questions now. But I do encourage um, the audience, uh, the participants to, um, to put those questions in the Q&A um, and we will come back to them at, at the panel session at the end. So thank you very much. That's got us off to a really brilliant start. Um, who knew that we would be able to grow algae in the desert? And I think that's that's and net carbon negative as well. Um, I think that's amazing. So um, I'm now going to invite um, Sam Watson-Jones, who is the co-founder of the um, Small Robot um, Company to um, present to us. Um, and this is um, um, work that's being um, supported through one of the other Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund um, programmes, uh, which is around um, autonomous and robotic systems. So over to you, Sam. Thank you. Thanks for uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, always pleased to, to talk at these events here. Innovate UK has been a, a huge supporter of ours over the the four and a half years that we've that we've been going. Um, so yeah, uh, good good morning, good afternoon, which, whichever it is. Uh, my name is Sam Watson Jones. I'm co-founder of Small Robot Company, um, and I'm a fourth generation arable farmer from Shropshire in the Midlands in the UK. So delighted to have the opportunity to tell you about what we're, we're building. Um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the dream double bottom line for farming. So this is the idea that you can both increase yields, but also build a more sustainable farming model. But the promise is never delivered and certainly, certainly the technology as it is presented to uh, in the farming industry at the moment isn't delivering on that. But this is what a small robot company is, is working towards for the world's largest crops. So for things like wheat and corn and soy. So let me take you through what we're building and why we think um, there's a real opportunity for us to be right at the center of a huge transformation in, in the farming system over the next few years. The first generation of agrobotics has really been driven by a need to automate existing processes. So there's going to be some interesting businesses built in this space for sure, reducing labour in higher value crops. But it doesn't answer the existential threat that is facing some of the world's staple crops. But what we're doing at Small Robot Company is delivering the next generation of, of technology. And this is something that we call per plant farming. So this is a, a radical approach which uses autonomous, lightweight vehicles to provide a near real-time view of each crop, um, each crop plant as it grows through the season, and then using this view to deliver a really precise, uh, timely intervention to achieve the optimal performance for each individual plant. So by doing this, by using this approach, um, we're looking to both gather data and take action on the plant level. And by using this approach, we're looking to strip out all sorts of excess uh, overuse of, of herbicides and fertilizer and pesticides. And because we are leaving the soil alone as much as possible to simply uh, 
fix itself. Um, we're leaving the ecosystem to do what it to do what it does best. Um, and also, this approach will will increase the rate with which soil sequesters carbon. And this this is not something that you can do with an incremental improvement to existing tech. To do per plant farming, you really need new hardware. You've got to develop. You've got to deliver the complete service from the from the ground up. And to make it work for millions of crop plants in a in a field, um, you need a different approach to that taken by other robotics companies that are out there at the moment. NIO and Eco Robotics being the obvious European, um, the obvious European examples. But we do think that what we're building here is ultimately going to make the tractor as redundant in time as the as the tractor made the horse a hundred years or so ago. And this uh, this idea. The, the power of this idea really came from farmers. So from the very start, for the first six months of, of my time at Small Robot Company back at the start of 2017, um, I just went around and spoke to farmers, probably spoke to 100 farmers in that first six months. And this concept emerged from, um, from those conversations with farmers. So it's not an individual process that needs automating. It's a new model of farming. And with it, a new way of providing what it is that farmers that farmers need. It's a service that looks after a crop throughout its life, and we're developing a suite of robots to deliver it. So I'm going to introduce to you uh, Tom, Dick, Harry, and Wilma. Tom lives on the farm. Uh, he's continuously gathering data on the plants and on the environment. Wilma is the brains of the operation, if you like, converting Tom's data into instructions for Dick and Harry. And Dick nurtures and protects the crop. He kills in weeds individually with an electrical charge and he sprays only the plants that need it. Harry then precisely plants the crop at exactly the right depth and spacing for the condition and, and giving, it the, giving each plant the best chance to, to achieve high yields. And importantly, farmers aren't gonna buy these robots. They're going to pay for a per hectare service. So they're gonna pay for the delivery of a, of a healthy crop. And it's, it's important to say that we're, um, we're not building three separate robots entirely to do this. Um, and to do that would be a huge undertaking, but what we're doing is we're creating a modular architecture in which the robots are going to use um, standardized components so that, um, uh, so that we can build something lightweight, um, but also something that, that is easily transferable and works um, on different crops that have different that have different characteristics. And let me show you an example of this working. So this is from this was taken uh, two or three weeks ago. This is on our trial site in Hampshire. This is our Tom robot, the version three of our Tom robot going out into the field uh, and scanning the field, truly creating that, that digital view of the of the field every single plant is being recognized every single weed is being recognized and each plant is being given an exact geo reference location so that we can then go back out to that exact location and do something to it and so the robot trundling along the, the front of the screen now is a prototype version of dick that is doing exactly that so taking a, lo a location created by tom and wilma and then going to that location and doing something. You can see that the, the, the non-chemical weeding robot Dick is, is an earlier stage prototype than, than the Tom robot. But what it is doing is it is identifying the individual weed. It is then going to that location. It is physically touching the weed with an electrically charged arm. You can see the probes at the bottom of the robot there. And then it is sending an electrical charge through the weeds, um, killing, killing, the, uh, killing the weed without using any chemicals. And so we, we have done this again through an Innovate UK grant, and this is a root wave probe that we have taken their, their handheld device and then developed a way to use that in a more accurate, repeatable way by fitting it onto a, onto a robot. And that's been um, yeah, all made possible by, uh, by, by the, the, the great support from from Innovate UK. Um, and so, oh, what has it jumped off that? Uh, and I'll finish there and happy to take any questions, um, but please do get in touch if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to hear some more. Thanks, Melanie. Okay, thanks very much, Sam. Um, 
I think that's quite fascinating. And I think that Wilma, as the brains, she must have a very big brain because there's probably a lot of information that actually is requiring analysis if you're analysing all of those plants and distinguishing your crop from your weeds. Um, so I think that's sort of mind boggling in a way, um, but, uh, but, but fantastic. Uh, anyway, again, encourage participants um, to put their questions um, into the, the Q&A and we'll have a chance um, to follow up some of those things. But um, really fascinating um, to think about what the future might actually look like um, and farmers controlling things remotely rather than, uh, rather than hands on, I guess that, that's part of that future. Thank you. Um, we'll now hand over and invite um, Kieran Olivares Whitaker um, to present. And Kieran is founder of EnterCycle, um, which is a company which is looking at uh, developing insect as a source of sustainable protein. Over to you, Kieran. Hi, thank you very much. I'm just checking that everyone can hear me okay. Um, if so, I'll continue. Um, as the previous two uh, panellists uh, said, Innovate UK have been a fantastic supporter of us kind of from conception to um, kind of industrialization. So I'm just going to share my presentation now. So EnterCycle, um, we're looking at the mass scaling of insect farming and insect farming technology. Most people, kind of I think the general public, do not realise that all farmed animals are fed on protein such as fish meal and soy meal. And these have kind of significant, uh, not just local, but also global issues on them. These current protein supplies are unsustainable. So soy protein is predominantly farmed in South America. Um, the only growth margins there are going to be to cut kind of more into the central belt regions of Brazil. And of course, we all know those kind of global problems that we're facing there. Fish meal, on the other hand, is mainly fished off the coast of South America as well, but every El Nino and El Nino, we have significant issues. And the long-term trend of both these uh, protein sources is going to become more and more. Um, apologies, can everyone still see my screen? Yeah, I think we're just um, sharing your slides, Kieran. Okay, apologies. Uh, I thought I'd shared the screen already. Um, I was going to share. Okay, do you want to go ahead and, and share? I think um, our UKRI events colleagues were sharing, but Kieran, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, can you now see the, the screen? Perfect. Thank you. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> as I was saying, the, 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 the further production of these two main protein sources are going to become ever more unsustainable. Um, and kind of one of the key issues here is that even though kind of local farmers in the UK want to be and are on the whole very sustainable, it's actually this international global web of protein sources that are one of the key kind of uh, environmental and um, uh, global issues that we're currently facing. On the positive side, you're now starting to see that consumers are also inc increasingly looking um, and valuing sustainable alternatives. So you can see this, whether this is in direct to human space or whether this is to animals or pets. Um, and the kind of the long-term trend in these two key industries is that demand is out is going to be outstripping supply. So year on year, the production of fish meal, which is one of the key um, protein feeds, is actually dwindling slightly, um, especially as this market is increasing dramatically globally because of increasing such as aquaculture and other farming. Um, activities. So by 2025, we'll be seeing around the global protein shortage of around 60 million tons. Um, and we need alternative solutions. And now kind of enter cycle of banging the drum that insects are going to be one of the kind of key solutions in the future. Um, but when uh, you look at it now, you're seeing um, banks such as Barclays here in the UK and Rabobank in Holland that are really saying that insects are actually going to be one of the circular economy solutions to this protein challenge. And so they've just released a large report um, this year, uh, seeing the kind of the, the massive growth, not just that we've seen over the last couple of years, but the trend that we're going to see over the next five to 10. So I'm just going to take one step back and give a little bit of a, a breakdown on how insects are farmed. So there are kind of four key main steps to this. You have the inputs. So uh, we use the black soldier fly for a reason, and that is because they are one of the fastest growing insects, but also they're able to consume the widest range of substrates. So anything from food waste to kind of agricultural side streams, and you know, even the long-term trend into, you know, dirtier waste streams, because ultimately that is what they're there for there in nature. 
uh, and their ability to upcycle and recycle is phenomenal. We then break this into two sections. So we have the farming practice of, of creation of new uh, flies and new eggs. And then we have the separate process of fattening up kind of one to two millimeter long larvae into kind of two and a half centimeter long larvae. So those two are very different approaches. But ultimately, the black soldier fly are able to be farmed in environmentally controlled situations anywhere in the world. So we've proven this, and as you can currently hear, uh, the trains rumbling overhead is because we're based currently in London Bridge. You know, not exactly what you think is the, the prime place in central London to farm insects, but it's proof that we can actually do this anywhere on the planet, whether that be in the Sahara Desert or all the way up to kind of the northern hemisphere, uh, very northern northern hemisphere. We then produce a whole insect out of this system, which we're then able to do three different things to. We can either dry and pulverize those insects into a kind of a fatted meal, or separately, we can defat that and separate out the lipids and the protein to drive from a 34 to a 62% protein, as well as having an insect oil. And very importantly from this system, we also have a fertilizer, which is actually called FRAS. So that is the remains of the insect. And we're seeing fantastic results already with larger growth of crops um, and that's not to do with the NPK value that's actually to do with plants are becoming stronger uh, and growing more fruiting bodies and being larger in a shorter period of time but ultimately what we care about here predominantly is the, the insects themselves and the fact that they can be then used to, as a sustainable inclusion into uh, products such as fish meal uh, and other animal feed and what we've seen actually uh, the reason why this market has opened up so much was in 2017 aquaculture in Europe became the first market in the world to enable insect protein to be a source. And we're now going to see this year uh, poultry and pigs also opening. So this is kind of a, a huge market opening for what is becoming a, a very kind of well-known technology, uh, but one that is yet to be kind of mastered at scale. And so the real technical challenge with black soldier fly and with any farm of insects is that you can't go and buy this off a shelf today. You know, even if you wanted to set up a facility, you would have to get right down to the basics of genetics, breeding, uh, two different um, production of larvae and eggs and versus the production of fattening up larvae for protein. Now, I always like to say it is very easy to farm insects badly. It is very hard to farm insects well. So in our first facility, we're looking at 1.5 to 3 billion insects at any given time. And so this means you need extreme high levels of quality control and um, quantity control throughout the entire process. And I very much like sex like baking a cake. If you have all the ingredients weighed out at the right level at the beginning, and what we're dealing with here at the beginning of the life cycle is, is insects that are kind of, you know, you can fit on the end of a pinhead all the way through one and a half billion of those through to the kind of the size of an inch. Um, and so what we need is reliable, consistent, predictable yields throughout that process. So as a company, we really focus on using kind of existing or um, kind of cutting edge agricultural and food production policies, but applying that to the insect industry. And again, as I said earlier, and, uh, Innovate UK have been you know, incredibly supportive in helping us to design and iterate what is essentially very, very hard um, R&D uh, steps to take but to now then deploy this at mass scale. So when we're looking at mass scale, last year we led and won the largest UK call in, in the food technology sector under the, the Future Food Production Systems, which is a, a nearly a 10 million project. We brought it together an entire ecosystem, including kind of end case users such as Tesco's ABI Agri Cook Agriculture, but also complementary insect companies here in the UK that are looking at different market sectors such as genetics and post-processing as well as regulatory authorities, because again, this is a brand new industry. And one of the kind of key challenges here is that as we are progressing this industry forward, because there are no insect facilities yet in the UK, we ha help to have to help set the regulation and make sure that it's streamlined for others to follow it. So this funding has been fundamental for us deploying what we're calling EntoFarm 1, which will be the first UK industrial insect um, facility in the UK, while we work with partners on post-processing, valorization and genetics. And again, this is really important for us because it confirms our status as not only insect specialists, but also insect leaders here in the UK and beyond. And we do not see the UK as the only kind of final market. One of the key reasons why insect production is so interesting is because you can produce it locally. So we, you know, you can target the salmon industry in Scotland, for example, by having plants there. Similarly, across the rest of the UK and other um, poultry and pig industries. And this is the same, you know, when you're looking at international markets, instead of shipping food half around the world, it's all about creating these kind of 
hubs within local um, countries to produce products for the local economy. Um, and so I will leave it there. We're EnterCycle and I very much look forward to hearing any questions and I'm happy to talk uh, as, you, as much as you like about insects and particularly black soldier flies. And I apologize, as I said, uh, you may hear the trains overhead uh, and that will continue to be the case because this is where our R&D facility is. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Kieran. And I think it's it, it's really fascinating to think about the, the possibilities of alternative sources of protein that insects actually do offer us. Um, and you know, and to be the first farm, the first farm facility for for this Enterfarm one, I think is a really exciting prospect, and I think ca has captured lots of people's imagination as well. So I, I'm sure there'll be questions from our participants um, later on. Okay, I'm now going to um, invite. Andrea um, Rosen to present to us and Andrea is um, the head of um, Smart City for Infarm um, which is a, a German-based company so I'm delighted that Andrea is, is joining us today. There she is um, and over to you Andrea. Thank you. Hi, nice to be here and thank you. And just as my previous panelists have said, it is a pleasure to, to work with Innovate UK um, as, as we have done since, uh, since 2020. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about Infarm and, I'm going, and what we're doing with Innovate UK. So first I will quickly uh, share my screen. Okay, hopefully everyone can see it. Um, so, our mission is to grow a smart worldwide in-farm network that brings farming to the people combining high-tech solutions with biological systems. Now our Global Gap certified farming as a service model combines a hybrid of large-scale automated plant growth factories and modular in-store farms that sit directly inside of our partners, which enables retailers, restaurants, and other partners uh, all to be farmers directly. So we actually enabled the first cloud-connected in-store farms. All of our farms are connected to a cloud-based farm brain that learns, adjusts, and improves yield and taste constantly. This is real-time information, making sure that everything we do is not only scalable, but also dependable and predictable. We do this by collecting over 50,000 data points throughout a plant's lifetime to create the perfect growing recipes. However, to create self-optimizing farms, we need to close the feedback loop and start measuring the biological outputs of our farms, plant quality, size, growth rate, health, and more. So this will accelerate the rate of growing recipe creation and crop innovation in ways never before seen in agriculture, which is what our winning ISCF a Future Food Production Systems project uh, will work on with incredible partners at Newcastle University, Robo Scientific, and Marks and Spencers. This will help us to escalate our artificial intelligence and machine learning capabilities to give vertical farming its largest technological advancement for optimized plant health, nutritional value, and energy consumption optimization. So just a bit about us in numbers. Um, as of today, we work with 30% of the top global retailers. Um, we have over 1,000 farms uh, now installed uh, with over 1,000 uh, in-farmers uh, with 10 active countries. We started here in the UK um, in September, 2019. So we're getting close to that two year mark uh, here in the UK and growing very strong. And we have over 7 million plants harvested. We also are now at over 70 different uh, varieties of plants. Um, so we're growing uh, extremely fast uh, with what we're doing um, with our plant diversity. Now, as the head of Smart City, my primary focus is leading the in-farm vision for vertical farming in the city of tomorrow and how it can work with existing infrastructure for resource efficient and scalable circular food production. This includes making sure our energy is extremely efficient and making sure that we can collaborate with partners who can uh, out offset what we do or as well as make our energy um, uh, renewable. And as we are living in a post pandemic world and our food system has to improve with solutions that focus on quality and safety. So high traceability mitigates supply chain risks and enables vertical farming to be pandemic proof, optimized and give us the most uh, scheduled and on demand food production that we have. Thank you. And look forward to answering any of your questions. 
Thank you, um, Andrea. I think that's a really sort of fascinating um, insight and lots of lots of possibilities. And I like the possibility of a yeah pan pandemic um, preparedness in there as well. So I think that that's incredibly uh, relevant. Um, so thank you for that presentation. And uh, again, encourage um, participants to um, keep asking questions um, and popping those into the Q&A. We have a lot there, so um, I'm not sure we'll be able to get through them, but there are some common themes sort of emerging. So I'll be ho hoping to bundle those up um, for our panelists. Um, I guess it, it, it's now really timely to, to invite Jack Farmer um, to present to us. Um, so Jack is the co-founder and chief scientific officer for Let Us Grow. And I think you'll, you'll see that there is some interesting, some different approaches, um, but, but relationship to um, what Andrea has just been talking to us um, about. So Jack, um, thank you for joining us um, and over to you. And I think, um, I think a colleague will be sharing slides for you. Yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll just wait till they pop up on the screen. Brilliant, great. So, hi, I'm, I'm Jack. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at Let Us Grow, uh, one of the co-founders as well. Uh, now, Let Us Grow, we are a, uh, we're a technology company. We've been going for about six years now. Uh, we design uh, hardware and software for the controlled environment agriculture industry. So, for clarity, that's both glass houses and vertical farms. Uh, we've been supported by two Innovate UK bids during this time, uh, very early doors with the Design Foundations bids, and then later on through the um, Industrial Challenge Strategy Fund. Really, I mean, it was fantastically useful, really helped us take our, our technology from patent through to commercialised uh, prototypes, and then again, through to commercialised products um, at the moment. So really fascinating, uh, really fantastic to be here today. If you don't mind just moving to the next slide, and this should be the, the last one that rolls through the rest of the presentation. Uh, okay, thank you. Great. Um, so in terms of what we do within the within the vertical farm and glass house sector, we can we design, we've got three primary technologies that we pioneer. The first is a irrigation system that uses a methodology called aeroponics. Now, basically what you do here, if you can play the video, if that's okay. Um, it, what, what, this, what this system does is it aerosolizes nutrient solution around plant roots, which effectively means that those roots have much greater access to oxygen. That means that we can enhance the growth rates of those crops and we can enhance productivity of existing glass house or vertical farming systems. We can also reduce, we can also enable the utilization of more biodegradable substrates because our substrates get less damp and actually get uh, retain, are retained longer in the system, which means you can evolve, um, avoid classic problems with hydroponic systems where your, your media may degrade. These systems can be substituted into existing glass houses, existing vertical farms, and present a really interesting opportunity to enhance existing systems and existing growers' productivity, whilst also uh, whilst also helping people innovate and stay ahead of this rapidly changing industry. The other side of our uh, the other string to our bow is in uh, software software development. So we uh, we have pioneered a a farm management and control system named Astara, which is really aimed at uh, helping existing vertical farming growers and existing glasshouse growers to optimize the labor efficiency of their facilities, ensure full traceability of the crops coming out of their facilities, and helping, uh, helping them scale up easily and, uh, and enabling transparency and ethics throughout their supply chain. So those are two core technology specialisms. Now, the first thing we've done is we've packaged that up into a container farm named Drop and Grow that we're selling around the UK uh, and expanding into Europe uh, at the moment. Um, and we're also partnering with larger scale facilities to, to deploy those technologies. So it's been a very exciting period of growth over the last two or three years, to bringing these to market. And uh, it's really, I guess, brought us into contact with loads of people in the industry. And what, what really I find very fascinating is how the advances in vertical farming and glasshouse farming in the UK are starting to uh, act, starting to dovetail with a broader push in, 
I'd say in the open field agricultural space towards more regenerative practices, towards greater transparency in terms of carbon ethics and supply chain. And I think there's a real conversation to be had about how the two systems can be complementary in certain situations and how perhaps they are in conflict in certain situations. So what I really see is this opportunity to really take a, a strategic approach when we're looking at our agricultural systems in actually bringing certain food production back onto a, a national footing, as was, as was mentioned earlier, so you can shorten supply chains, but actually apply the right technology or agricultural principles in the right place. There's been a very good report that came out recently about the, the relative uh, where you would put a glass house and where you put a vertical farm. And it's very much driven by the temperature outside and the water availability. So you can see how those diverge. Um, so I, in general, I think that's where that's what we're pushing on to now. We've got our technology really, um, really kind of nailed down from a, from a kind of a growing principles perspective. We're looking to partner and scale up, but we're also looking at that that application and where the, where is the most ethical, and most product, most um, impactful situation to deploy these controlled environment agriculture systems in order to have the best positive impact upon uh, on a global level. So I think I'll, I'll leave that there. Um, hopefully there's some, some good questions. Uh, I look forward to engaging with everyone else and uh, hopefully answering a few. Okay, uh, thank you, Jack. And I think we were just seeing a rerun of the, the, the video there um, as well. And, and I think, um, I'm sure that when we get to the panel session, there will be some similar questions um, around your systems. Um, there's a few sort of coming up um, for both yourself and, and Andrea to think about. So it would be good to explore some of those things. And I was interested to hear what you said about sort of the complementarity and the conflicts with, with existing production systems as well and, and, and get some of your thoughts there. Excellent. So um, everyone has been doing fantastically well at keeping to time. So we're actually ahead of time, which I think is always a bit of a, um, a, a nice position to be in as chair. But that doesn't mean that our final speaker in this session, who I'm just about to introduce, um, can run over their particular time. So just sort of um, say that as a warning. So our next speaker is, is Nick Cliff, who is um, Deputy Challenge Director for one of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, uh, one of the challenges, which is sustain smart, sustainable plastic packaging. So um, Nick, I'm going to hand over to you to give the um, final presentation in this group um, of presentations today, and then we'll come together for the panel discussion. Over to you. Hey, thank you, Melanie. Right, I shall try and uh, share my screen. I hope that's worked. Okay, so uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Nick Cliff. I'm indeed Deputy Challenge Director of the Smart Sustainable Plastic Packaging Challenge, which is one of the ISCF challenge programmes. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about sustainable food packaging. Um, the question I suppose we begin with is, is what's the role that packaging can play in improving the overall sustainability of our food system? Um, now, there are lots of different ways in which packaging um, is an intrinsic part of our food supply chains, uh, absolutely and 100% integrated into the journey of food from farm to table. One of the most obvious, and in fact, for me, one of the key ways in which packaging contributes to sustainable food is its role in extending life and protecting food, thereby reducing food waste. Food waste is absolutely critical task to, to address if we're gonna hit carbon targets uh, and if we are gonna provide uh, the right quantities of food equitably around the world. And plastic does an incredible job at extending life. It's by no means the only way that we can do this. Smart supply chains, just-in-time delivery all play their role, but packaging is a pretty straightforward way to do it. And its impacts are extreme. Um, from shrink wrap cucumbers, which often incense people, buying you maybe an extra week of shelf life, to quite substantial gains for shipping around uh, of meat uh, and other proteins. So, we're kind of stuck with packaging and, and, and packaging plays its role in giving us a sustainable food system. 
but it's not without its problems. And I'm sure every single person on the call is well aware of the challenge that we face from plastic pollution. So we take a look back to where did it all begin? Um, plastics have been around for quite some time, but they started to find their way into the food supply system uh, around about the turn of the 19, around about 1904. So, uh, in fact, the story goes that um, a Swiss chemist by the name of Brandenburger was sitting in a cafe in France and he saw someone at an adjacent table knock over a bottle of red wine, ruining the pristine linen tablecloth. So he thought, what can I do with this newfound class of materials called plastics to help? So he took what was then a, a, a relatively um, a new material, cellulose, and he started spraying it onto linen tablecloths. And sure enough, it protected the tablecloth from a red wine spill, but unfortunately it wouldn't stick. And in fact, he found that he could peel up those sheets of cellulose and that ultimately became cellophane. Now, cellophane was not without some teething problems, uh, it needed some work um, uh, to turn it into a stable material, but pretty quickly its role as a food packaging material was recognised. And in the early 20s, uh, DuPont bought the rights to cellophane, did a little bit more work on coatings, and then launched it as probably the first food packaging plastic material. And it was widely adopted. Um, by around the 30s, it had really sort of found its place. And it's at that same time that actually the way that we consume food, particularly in the developed world, was also changing with the advent of things like supermarkets. People no longer queued up or wanted necessarily to queue up to talk to an assistant to be served food in individual packets. They wanted to be able to see food and choose it. Uh, they wanted to be able to pick it off the shelves while still being certain that it was safe. Um, and again, this led to further innovation. So as we said earlier, meat does not age well once it's cut. So it was in short order that innovation started to take place and the cellophane packaging started to get things like a pink tint to keep meat looking nice. Started to have antioxidants added to help preserve it and protect it. And even oxygen barriers as our understanding of chemistry and materials developed to start to give us the performance that plastic packaging has now. But where did this end up? By the mid 50s, um, this is a picture from a, a famous article in packaging circles in Life magazine celebrating the nature of the throwaway society. If anything, we went too far. All sorts of products that didn't have to be single use were not only being made from plastics, but almost their single use disposability was being celebrated, mainly because we didn't understand at the time the impacts that these materials would have on the environment. Now, Life magazine uh, ceased publication around the 2000s, but what would the article in Life magazine look like today? The image would be more like this. Everyone's aware of the problems that plastic packaging um, creates um, from pollution to, um, we're finding it everywhere, from, from, from the deepest ocean trenches to the highest mountains, in the tiniest particles, which are finding their way right throughout the food chain, including into ourselves. As a species, we've even managed to spread plastic packaging waste to the moon and to Mars. So one moon and one extra planet where you can now find plastic packaging. So our challenge area and lots of work that we've done across UKRI, bringing together researchers and innovators is to develop more sustainable approaches to plastic packaging. So just some of the areas in which we're working, we're doing loads of work in materials. So this is a company called Nopla, who've developed agar-based edible pouches. Uh, so they're working to package condiments, replacing sachets, which are a huge source of litter, but not just in that application. They're also coating um, board products to give you the kind of performance you need for takeaway food containers, but ones which are completely compatible with paper recycling. And we're seeing other materials development relevant to earlier speakers materials being made from, from insect proteins, materials being made from algae, uh, algae sources, all changing the face of materials and allowing better end of life options. We're also focusing and doing a lot of innovation and research around just getting rid of packaging completely. I'm sure lots of people will have started to see these unpackaged, no packaging solutions cropping up, even with mainstream retailers. There's lots of work still to do, those products and those foods still need to be kept safe. They still need to be transported around. You still need to be able to deliver the right amount safely, securely, 
So check out some tools work. So lots of innovation there, driving just eliminating single use packaging completely. And it's not just at the big retailers, we're working with small SMEs. This is an example of a company called Collibox, who are creating reusable food containers for restaurants and cafes, um, takeaway cups and so on and so forth. Where this starts to get interesting is it, these are underpinned by data-driven approaches. So all sorts of ways in which we can predict sales quantities, logistics, shipping, again, minimizing food waste, but also helping people keep track of what they're eating, how much of things that they're eating and nutritional guidance. Moving on, we're also seeing a lot of innovation in the recycling of packaging. We'd love to be able to eliminate all single use packaging and perhaps one day we might get there, but until we get there, we still need to develop new technologies and better ways to work with the packaging we have. This is a project which uses uh, fluorescing markers because one of the biggest challenges to achieving high recycling rates is actually being able to sort the different types of plastic from each other and also understand what the packaging might have been used for before. Um, we can do very high quality recycling. You can turn a plastic milk bottle back into a new plastic milk bottle, but you have to be able to make sure that you're only putting milk bottles into that process. And sometimes that's not easy. So these kinds of uh, ways of coding extra information into packaging facilitate rapid sorting and allow the really high quality recycling outputs. And just my last slide, just here's an example of, of a product. This is Garcon Wines. That, that encompasses all those things. So what you've got here is new business models. This is designed for home delivery. That bottle of wine will happily fit through your letterbox. The bottle itself is made entirely from recycled plastic and it's designed specifically to be compatible with recycling systems. Um, so all in all, all of these innovations coming together to try to ensure that the packaging can play its part in delivering an overall sustainable food system. Of course, the drawback is if you spill your glass on wines onto your nice linen tablecloth, you're still going to stain it. We're not quite there yet, but um, give us time. We'll get there in the end. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, uh, Nick. And I think that's a nice way to round off uh, sort of the presentations with, with getting us to think about something uh, slightly different in terms of the packaging. And, and I, for one, know how frustrated it can how frustrating I find it to um, receive things which are over wrapped um, and the vast array of different plastics as well always seems to um, be a curious thing to me. So what I'd like to um, do is just to say a huge thanks to all of the presenters and I'd like them all now to reappear to uh, turn their videos um, back on. Um, and um, we will start off with the Q&A session. So we've had a lot of questions um, come in um, to the, um, to the um, Q&A, some of which are sort of interrelated. So what I'm going to do is to sort of to try and um, bring some of them together because I think we, we won't be able to get through all of them. But if you do still have questions, do still keep them um, coming in and um, I guess my UKRI event colleagues will flag anything that um, that I fail to miss sort of um, in this. Um, I can't see everybody so I think who are we missing? We're missing Kieran. Has, has, ah Kieran there you are. <laughs> Thank you, good to see you. Thanks for, 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 re, for rejoining. Um, so a number of questions that sort of came um, in via the sort of the the, the um, Q and A sort of centre, particularly around sort of thinking about novel novel forms of food and, and different types of um, food production. Um, and so there were there were questions that we had around you know what what's the opportunities? How are consumers going to feel about some of the um, about some of the alternative food sources that we've heard about. Um, will we want to eat them? Um, are there any of the um, products on the market? I think Raphael people seem to be quite interested in, in understanding what the taste of algal um, products were um, and what the opportunities might be. And, and clearly, I guess, Kieran, interesting to hear your thoughts on the possibility of, of insect protein for human consumption. I think this is something that people are quite interested in. So perhaps I can um, ask Raphael and, and Kieran to comment first um, around um, 
sort of that broader consumer opportunities for human consumption. You talked about animal consumption and, and what you might be thinking in those sorts of areas, please. I'll go very quickly. The color, the flavor, uh, even the oiliness of the fish all comes from algae originally. Um, a lot of the flavors are very familiar. They're present in Japanese and Asian food all over the place. Um, and things, many algae taste fishy, or rather the fish taste like the algae. Um, on the other hand, I actually, me personally, I prefer the defatted, depigmented biomass, which is very rich in protein. And it's kind of a gray pasty thing. One thing we do not have is um, fibrous meat-like strong stringy proteins. And so uh, we do have to work with people to help extrude our material and work it. Now we, we are doing that and it's exciting because uh, frankly, um, we can be less processed, organic uh, and sustainable without having to go through 27 ingredients to make a fake kebab or sausage. But I'll let Kieran answer as well. So, so, so far, our customers, our uh, taste testers, and here the customers are companies like it. Okay, I think that was the question, whether also whether there were any of your products already um, available, but... Not, but not, not commercially, not yet. Not commercially, but perhaps there's an opportunity with our UKRI staff who are, um, will be willing additional oh, taste testers, perhaps. Well, we can make that happen. <laughs> okay, Kieran, your thoughts? I think just to follow on from Raphael, actually, I used to live in Southeast Asia for three and a half years and kind of seaweed based, seaweed based or kind of algae based products are just, you know, they're just mainstream. You have them in, in, your, in your noodles and your soups and your, and so it's more of a westernized culture catching up. So I think kind of it's, it's a, a much easier step to see that because we just have to look where else in the world is doing that. Um, and actually, ironically, two thirds of the world already eat insects as well. So if you look on, um, uh, you know, it's specialist uh, products in many countries, such as grasshopper um, flour in, in in wraps in Mexico, or um, the kind of uh, in Asia where it's actually kind of topping or addressing a crunchy topping. So, uh, I think there's a kind of key aspect to here. It, it, like insects for human will come. You can already buy in supermarkets now, kind of uh, kind of crisp replacement insects. But I think where the future will be will be in texturized proteins and in kind of extruded um, pr protein flowers that will then go into existing product lines such as pasta breads, etc. And you're starting to see that study coming. As a company, we're not a final market. Um, we're, we're not a we're not a B2C company. We're not a consumer company. We are a, a mass production. Um, you know, we are at the at the base of the food web. If you want to go in that structure. We are looking mainly at a technology play here, so licensing our technology into various industries. So whether that is into pet food, human, animal feed, you know, we almost don't mind because the whole idea here is, is the mass production of locally produced sustainable protein products. But just to say, I've eaten a hell of a lot of insects, I've eaten a hell of a lot of black soldier flies, even if you have them just dried, uh, they very quickly, they taste like a... Uh, uh, a, a there's several nuts they taste like because they kind of got that oily, nutty texture, that quite earthy texture. But again, the future will be kind of put these embedded into existing product lines. Okay, and I was just interested in your point there about you know you're 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 sort of there at the, the base of the food chain, I guess, as you were saying, in sort of that primary production of protein. Um, obviously, you're sort of in that development phase. I, how optimistic are you that that you can actually? Um, form something which is competitively priced actually if you're thinking about sort of animal feeds presumably that's an important consideration alongside all of the sustainability factors that we're talking about obviously using the waste um, waste food as sort of feedstocks. So the key here is legislation um, if you look around the world it's uh, right now insects in Europe are classified as a farmed animal therefore you have to treat them as such and feed them as such only in feed are they considered to be a farmed animal in every other industry, whether that's kind of ph pharmaceuticals, um, uh, 
uh, other sciences, they're treated as, as, as a, you know, they don't have a backbone, therefore they're, they're classified differently. So the key factor that's going to make this price competitive is going to be legislative change. Um, and the trend globally is, and in, even Europe is now starting to move ahead of the UK with Brexit, is looking at kind of other input streams from, you know, from restaurants, from other kind of food production systems that will enable the price point to massively reduce. So the technology can really take it further. But again, legislation has to come in hand in hand. Okay, and I guess people were also there were questions coming up, um, sort of thinking about concerns about whether if any of the black soldier flies were to um, sort of sneak out of their um, of their living environments, would that potentially have impacts on if there are non-native species? If, if and obviously, would you like to comment on that, Kieran? Yes, so black soldier flies are the, of these kind of five species of insects are the only non-disease, non-pest species that's being permissible. So the, the reason why is the adults don't actually have a traditional mouth system or digestive system. So they don't really, they don't eat food per se. So they'll never land on, on manure or land on you and then kind of cause that kind of potential vector. Plus the larvae only eat uh, rotting, rotting material. So they, they, they will never climb a tree and, and start eating, you know, apples like other insects can do or, or do. And, pests. So that's one aspect to put away. Uh, secondly, black soldier flies have now been found on every continent in Antarctica, as far north as the Czech Republic. Um, they are a naturally globalised insect. But just to kind of be a, a real key point, is because they are traditionally a sub-tropical uh, species, they actually, their, their ability to um, to reproduce in this country, for example, is, is, is almost impossible because they need that kind of certain cl climatic conditions during the summer to be very, very stable for a prolonged period of time for that population. So you just won't really see it happen in the UK. But again, you already see them as far north uh, as kind of Scotland and other parts of Europe. So it's a, you know, it's a very, very um, friendly fly and a very, very <laughs> friendly insect. Um, and actually the reason they're called black soldier flies is because they look a little bit, they mimic a wasp, but they're actually, they, as they don't have a mouth part, they're just trying to re rely on the fact that they can pretend to be one. Um, so that's part of their history. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to um, sort of move on to another sort of set of questions. And this is particularly, um, I think, for, for Andrea and Jack, a number of questions have come in around sort of this, the energy requirements um, for the types of, of production systems that you're talking about, whether on that small scale, Andrea, you know, things which are sort of either in supermarkets in potentially in residential areas etc but also Jack thinking about the sort of the container scale um, so perhaps you could um, sort of share, share with us some of your thoughts around you know is this a sustainable way of food production do those energy requirements um, you know how demanding really are they how can you how can you alleviate that to really move towards that sustainable piece. Um, so I think Jack's suggesting Andrea might like to take that question first. It's also, I think, not the first panel that Jack and I have been on together where, <laughs> where we answer questions around this. I think we're both uh, well versed here. Um, so first, I'd like to say that besides our, our small scale in-store farms, um, as I also showed, we do large scale automated um, growth centers. So we're, we're now quite um, uh, showing what we can do with both the small scale and, and the large scale. So when it comes to the small scale, this is not what we control because they are inside of our retailers. So that goes to what they do. Um, but in regards to what we have in our growth centers, we are hooked up to 70% renewable energy at this, at this stage because vertical farming is in its infancy, uh, which I'm sure uh, Jack will also agree to. We're at the beginning of such um, a large scale industry that's only going to become more and more mainstream, which is why more and more companies are starting to do this now. And you can't replace the sun. However, what we are what we are seeing is that even though um, it is energy intensive, we are finding more and more ways to supplement this. Whether it be the integrations, whether um, it be even this project we are working on with uh, Innovate UK, um, to optimize um, our consumption as, as best as possible, to to optimize our growth recipes um, and make our our consumption per plant. Um, to go down, so that cost to go um, way down, which is really important. Um, I have so much more to say on the topic, but I think I should let Jack talk. Yeah, uh, no, thanks, thanks, Jack, for stopping. Um, so yeah, I think it's a really good question. I think the, and obviously it's different if you're in a glass house in a vertical farm. If you're in a glass house, you have free, free energy, but you have much less water efficient and CO2 efficient. So that that's kind of your resource interplay between the two systems. Now, I guess what I would say about 
I think, actually just general kind of controlled environment horticulture, is that it's ethical depending on what it displaces rather than being additive, like we've spoken with, with, with algae. It, it's, it's a basically, what you're doing is you're taking a part of the food supply chain and displacing it with a known system that actually has much less externalities than you would get with, a, with if you were growing, for example, tomatoes in the UK. You're gonna to struggle to grow tomatoes in the UK all year round. In fact, it's pretty much impossible. Um, you could grow tomatoes all year round in the UK and therefore displace imports. The, the key thing to do is to understand the externalities and to understand the supply chain you're displacing. So that's what I'm kind of referring to when I'm saying, once you understand that, is a vertical farm or a glass house more, more productive? And that, and that really comes down to the climate. So for example, if you were growing in Abu Dhabi versus uh, the Netherlands versus Scandinavia, it happens to be more efficient to grow in a temperate region to grow in a glass house because it, you don't lose as much water vapor. Um, and actually it's just generally more productive based upon the, the light ingress from the, um, from the natural environment. However, in Scandinavia, a vertical farm can outcompete that glass house because it's too cold outside. In Abu Dhabi, it can outcompete the vertical farm because there's not enough water and they can't, and the water escaping from your glass house will, will inhibit the operation. However, in the Abu Dhabi, it is more energy efficient to still grow in a glass house. So you see this complex interplay of factors that say it's about putting the right thing in the right place. Yeah. Now, if you're still building a big building with loads of steel, concrete and lights, the fact is there's a lot of embedded carbon in there. So if you're displacing organic agriculture, that's not going to make sense. If you're displacing air freighted or, or long distance freighted uh, salad crops or salad vegetables, that will make sense. So I think the key thing for me is about transparency. It's about ensuring that all these facilities are actually audited from a life cycle perspective. Mm -hmm. And it's about ensuring that uh, there's kind of a that people know what the what the choices are. I think it's about ensuring that that's clear. That that's that's a really good good answers from both of you around that, and and just highlighting the complexity actually, and and really understanding the true cost. You mentioned the externalities there as well, Jack, and I think we we don't typically in the UK and developed nations really consider those um, that those externalities. Um, and uh, there were a couple of questions sort of related to that in 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 the Q and A as well around do we actually know the total carbon footprint for producing a ton of lettuce in different systems? Obviously, as you said, it's going to depend on the location as well, and you really have to factor all of those things in. But more broadly, do you think we have the tools currently to actually to be able to understand and do those accurate types of comparators so that consumers can make an informed choice? Andrea. Yes, and also just to add to what I think Jack said earlier, which also intersects with this, with the externalities, is also what markets are more grid um, and carbon intensive. This also changes a bit. We're, we're currently evaluating this now with all of our different markets, so this way we can really understand um, in which places um, we're taking less from the grid and other places where we're taking more. Um, and I think that, that making sure that, um, that we are evaluating this in the infancy of where we are in this, uh, in with this industry is extremely important because we're now at this part where we're understanding how we operate, not just in farm. I'm, I'm sure Jack would agree here too, as well as other vertical farming companies, making sure that we're operating in, in, in the best way possible. And then we can also get to the bottom of how do we make sure this is the most sustainable practice um, possible. But we have to evaluate the full picture, just as Jack said, it's not just, are we looking at carbon? We're also looking at the full sustainability story, which is around biodiversity, water usage. And I think this is extremely important to make sure that we're looking at. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I think the, and the simple answer is that yes, we do have all the tools we need to audit uh, an indoor farm or a glass house in terms of ethics. I think. The one thing I would be, um, I think is really interesting for researchers and policymakers is that actually a, a vertical farm and a, and a glass house, whilst energy intensive to build, is a known system. Once you have actually modeled the environmental impact of that system, it doesn't change that much depending on where you put it. So actually, you, you then have a known entity that you can compare against mm. the vast variety of different food production systems out there for conventional horticulture. So at that point, it becomes much more of a, 
I guess you can make much more informed decisions because actually what you need to do then is locally understand your supply chains and identify whether there actually is an opportunity here from an ethical standpoint as well as the economic standpoint. If there is, great, you have a known system you can place there. Um, so, and then the challenge for us as, a, as industrial players and as technologists in horticulture is actually just to make that system more efficient, at which point, environmentally efficient, I'm sorry, at which point you bring more and more places into your field of operation. So yeah. that, that's how I'd see it um, going forward. Okay, that's great, thank you. I'm gonna uh, turn to, to Sam now. So some questions around sort of um, the, the robotics. And I think there were some um, quite interesting questions here around, um, you know what, what you're pro proposing is is quite a different model system so you are looking to um to automate to provide a service and there were questions around um both you know how long would it take for your systems or perhaps ideally um to scan say a 10 hectare um plot um and and what are the likely um what's the likely affordability you know the cost of the service because obviously if you want people to take this up they've got to see the benefits and the advantages of that so perhaps you could just sort of comment start off by commenting around that yeah sure so the uh the tom robot that you saw uh, covers about two and a half hectares an hour um so at the moment we're operating sort of an, an eight hour shift so he's doing about 20 hectares in, in a day. Um, in time, of course, you'll be completely autonomous. Um, so that should then go up to at least at least 60 hectares in a day. Um, and and, and we're, we're not there yet, but that's what we would we would aim to be at, at something similar for uh, for the non-chemical weeding robot as well. Um, and in terms of cost, yeah, it, I think initially it comes in it comes in uh, at something similar, certainly very comparable to what a farmer would pay today. I think the opportunity for what we're developing here, though, is that over time it becomes significantly cheaper for a, for a farmer to manage a plot of land. You know, actually, if you think that one of the the near certainties that farmers have in their heads at the moment is that it's going to be more expensive for me to farm my land in five years time than it is today um, and that drives all sorts of decision making and not all of it is very good decision making um, because it then it then means that people pay silly prices for land because they think well, we're achieving economies of scale it means that people are thinking only in terms of size of machine and efficiency and that has negative environmental consequences, loss of biodiversity, reducing soil health, um, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, the, you know, let's take the technology that we're talking to each other on now that has simultaneously become more powerful and cheaper over the last 10 to 15 years and longer, in fact. Um, but why, why couldn't that same trend be applied to, to broad, broad, acre, broad acre farming um, with, with new technologies in place? So we'll start off something similar, but over time, I think yeah, it'll become cheaper for, for farmers to, to, to operate their farms. Thank you. There were also um, a number of questions and that we're interested in understanding how, how this may be applied to other cropping systems, whether it could be used for perennial crops, um, for example. Um, you know, is, is there a, a memory in the system so that the system remembers where it got rid of a weed previously in case it didn't quite do the job or something else comes back or there were seedlings around that, you know, is, are there pieces like that, you know, so, because obviously the demonstration was on, um, was on cereal crops that you gave us, yeah. so sort of diversification, I guess. There's, yeah, so there's, 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 there's a couple of things. So let me, let me answer the sort of the diversification one and then, and then the wider potential. So yes, we've, we've we focused on wheat to start with the potential really for per plant farming is that you yeah you you have data and understanding of every single plant in the field and that can do huge things for biodiversity we think so in the first instance we are pretty close now to being able to identify not only identify that that is a weed but actually to categorize that weed as well and say so it's that particular species of weed and that then becomes interesting because, as I think someone rightly said in the in the comments, you know, not all weeds are are are, are that um, are causing that much harm to the to the to the target crop. Some of them are really competitive and do need to be do need to be taken out. But actually, others are are increasing biodiversity. Maybe they're a food source for invertebrates, or they're attracting a particular type of pollinator, or something like that. And what we will be able to do is to selectively weed. So we'll be able to to use a, a layer of, of AI that says this weed, zero tolerance, 
um, needs to be, if you identify it, needs to be taken out. But this other weed, um, actually up to a certain population per meter squared, that's fine. It's not going to cause any problems. Maybe it actually adds a benefit. And so you can leave that in place. And then, and then for the, I mean, where this ultimately leads to, um, you know, I think ultimately it's going to be possible to, to have multiple species growing in the same field. We're going to move away from monocultures. Because if you can stick a seed in the ground, you can watch that seed turn into a plant. You can treat it differently to the plant next to it throughout its life cycle. Why wouldn't you get a mix of different crops in there? Because as soon as you do that, you immediately reduce the risk of disease. You immediately reduce um, overuse of particular of particular nutrients. And that is ultimately where per plant farming is leading. And so, you know, we've we've started with wheat. Um, and actually, there are a lot of challenges around starting with wheat. It's a very densely populated, very messy field. And we've solved a lot of the technical issues uh, in, in, with, with that crop. And then we believe that's going to transfer very quickly to, to, to other crops. Um, and ultimately, I think that this sort of technology is going to be used on any outdoor farm um, anywhere, in, anywhere in the world growing any crop um, of, of, of any size. Because the because the the foundation the foundation concept of can you gather data on an individual plant and then just do something to that individual plant applies to to whatever you're growing. Okay, thanks, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm now I'm sort of slightly mourning perhaps the loss of the traditional tractors. I grew up in an agricultural area in East Anglia and I spent many happy hours you know going across the stubble fields to take my daddy's sandwich tea or something sitting in the tractor cab with them it's going to be lost to a whole generation in the future perhaps but um but I don't know that's just my sort of childhood memories um thank you I was I was, I was exactly the same and, <laughs> and we have we have we have stories you know I can remember my grandfather who remembered when the first tractor arrived yes. um on, on their farm and everyone was exactly the same morning the end of horse horse drawn horse drawn plows and you know the world the world the world moved the world moves on but i was yeah i understand what you're saying <laughs> okay um we're, we're moving on in time and I, I just wanted to sort of to turn um to nick really um it's just very curious to me about why we have such a um a whole variety of different plastics that find their way to wrapping up our food that actually makes this problem of sorting plastics for recycling a huge problem so what do you think there are opportunities there around sort of incentivizing how we can reduce that that diversity to actually to help with that recycling issue yeah i think there are there, there are enormous opportunities uh, i mean you know how many types of plastic are there you know, there's no one answer to that question. You know, most people or, or some people will know that if you look on the bottom of a piece of plastic packaging, you'll probably find a little number somewhere. And that number is probably going to be somewhere between one and seven. So there's seven broad categories. But we demand so much functionality from our food packaging these days that often um, there are multiple layers, there are multiple materials. And each one of those components performs a particular function. But I think there's lots of opportunity to simplify. And um, some of the very cutting edge research we're doing, both looking at what we can do with existing known and relatively well understood polymers, as well as some of the, the completely novel materials, is how do we deliver that same amount of functionality using a, 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 a smaller palette of materials. And then that leads on to having the commensurate benefits in it easier to recycle. The other way that we're going is um, sort of right now, you know, the, one of the hottest topics in terms of recycling for plastic packaging is the development of chemical recycling. So this is where we actually can take quite a diverse heterogeneous mix of stuff, crisp packets, sachets, plastic bags, um, whatever you sort of call that kind of hybrid, is it film or is it a tray that a lot of uh, sort of meat and fish products are coming in now, throw it all essentially into one big reaction vessel and actually break it back down to a sort of rich hydrocarbon soup 
not a million miles dissimilar from the kind of fossil resources that we're pulling out of the ground and we make virgin plastic from. And from there, we can go back to effectively new plastic. So that's a big focus for us at, at the moment. But, you know, one step ahead, further afield, still at the research stage, is actually replacing those chemical recycling systems quite possibly with biological recycling systems where it'll be enzymes and microbes. And, and then we can design packaging materials that are food for them and it'll all get converted round, shifting to a sort of fully biological cycle. Absolutely. And, and it wouldn't surprise you to hear me say that, yes, biology has, you know, has amazing diversity that we can actually harness for exactly these types of things and bio-based processes and platforms are clearly the future and engineering biology. Um, so absolutely agree on that one. Um, we're getting towards the end of the session and I just sort of want to turn to each of the panellists in turn to sort of get their perspectives. And it's building on that point, really, that Nick was just made, you know, you're innovators, you're taking forward these really exciting ideas. I think you've really fueled people's imagination today from, from the questions that we've had. And we haven't had time to answer all of them, but we will try and, and provide answers and so um, to those because there's some important points. But from your perspectives, each of you, and, and I'll, I'll go through in the order that we heard the presentations, is there one thing that from, and ask from the research base, so you're the innovators, but is there one thing that if you had the answers from the research base or one question that you put to the research base that would really help you, what might that be? Maybe that's too difficult a question, but that would help you um, in your businesses. So I'm going to turn to you, Raphael, first. Just short answers, less than a minute. Super quick, uh, regulatory hand-holding would be very welcome. Uh, we find the regulatory environment, not just here in the UK, EU, US, confounding. And number two, um, genuine comparability in terms of total impact, everything from social impact, water footprint, uh, land use, carbon footprint, it, there are 50 billion measures in 50 billion directions and one and an industry agreement. The last one is I'd like to work with all of you, every one of you. You are fantastic. Great, thank you. Um, Sam. Yeah, I mean, I'd, so I'd, I'd, echo, I'd echo those. I mean, I think uh, industry leadership in terms of legislation and, and also in terms of particularly if you think about primary food production on farms around carbon measurement. Um, I think that could be that could be really interesting. I mean, I think we're, I, I, I think, actually, I think for in field outdoor farming, we're actually reasonably well supplied in terms of research, innovative research going on. An area that I think is being uh, under considered is the potential for artificial intelligence once you truly have a digital a digital data set. There's perhaps too much thinking around automation and not enough thinking around what a truly automated, um, uh, sorry, a, a truly digitized farming system could look like and what are the patterns that we might spot. But the, but actually, I, I, to, to take a slightly different angle on the question, I think that the the major opportunity or the major the major problem, whichever way you want to look at it, for UK farming at the moment is is around commercialization. We're very well supplied in terms of research, but there's not enough people commercializing that research um, at, uh, at the moment. Okay, thank you. Perhaps I can turn to um, Kieran for his thoughts. Yeah, I think again, there's a similar echo running through uh, everyone I assume here is because a lot of us are pushing on the front of innovation. Therefore, we are, we are the, the people pushing on the barriers of regulation. And that, is, and that is always going to be the case with these industries is that uh, we, we need the regulation to move as quick as the, in, the innovation moves. And I think um, with kind of UK leaving the single market and having the ability to change regulations, this should be something that we should really be focusing on to be able to push uh, our, you know, our values quicker um, because this is ultimately what is going to make or break, I think, many of these industries uh, in, in the time frames we need them because regulatory improvement is always the thing that takes the longest and yet um, is the one that could be the most beneficial to everyone. And I'll hold it there. Yeah, and, and I agree about that point about, you know, needing these things now, um, and particularly if the government is pressing and uh, bringing forward targets about um, sort of carbon reductions as we just heard about overnight. So I think, you know, absolutely. 
I think there's, there's a there's a, there's an interesting quandary here because you know through the government and down through you guys and Innovate UK we're being funded and yet through the regulatory bodies of the government we're being delayed I suppose and there's that there's that tension yeah, between we it. need to join those things up absolutely um okay I'm going to turn to Andrea for her thoughts yeah I definitely agree with uh, my fellow panelists here I think even on top of regulation it's just really how the public sector can work um more with even a collaborative private sector so this way we can make all the changes um to to our broken food system that we have now so it's not just changing the rules, but it's um, how can we all work together so this way we, we all reach the same goal. And I think that that's super important. Um, besides that, I also definitely agree with what uh, Rafael had said uh, much earlier on, on industry standards around uh, measurements of our environmental factors. I think that this is extremely important because there's so many numbers floating around. Um, it's hard to find one truth in this and a lot of everyone can manipulate it to the way they want. And that's not what our aim is. Our aim is for all of us is to have um, carbon friendly, uh, environmentally safe um, practices for our food system. So I think aligning on this is extremely important. Thank you. And Jack, I thought we'd lost you for a moment, but you've returned. Oh, yeah, um, didn't like the question. Um, no, the, uh, <laughs> no, I think there's a few things I'd echo. I think the, the, the point around transparency within the food system, like I said, very hard to benchmark your technology and scale it up if you don't know what you're scaling up against. It's a very opaque food system. There's not much, not much data on actually, on actually the constituent parts of the food system that you can access unless you're a big retailer. And they guard that quite, quite securely. Yeah. 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 Um, so, the, so that transparency is really, really important to scale up something um, over the next 10 years. Otherwise, you don't know how ethical you're being. You have to make some broad assumptions. Um, on a more granular level, in horticulture, I think there's a real opportunity for biologically derived feeds and substrates. Um, so effectively replacing inorganic uh, fertilizers uh, with biologically derived or organic, chemically organically derived feeds. Um, replacing rock wool, which is a home insulation material that's mainly used in horticulture as a substrate, which is uh, a, uh, not the smartest thing in the world, um, but very good at growing things. Um, and the last would be, uh, I think there's a, there's a real opportunity again in, in kind of in soil free horticulture to implement microbial ecology uh, based research. And there's a real gap in understanding as to the microbial communities that actually develop in soil free systems, whether they can be co beneficial. Yeah. If the research is being done, it's not been published. <laughs> so, so it'd be good to get more of that into the public domain. Excellent. Thank you, Jack. And uh, finally to you, Nick. Oh, tempted to say we need a lot more research into wine packaging because the project <laughs> meetings are always fun. But more seriously, um, I think, as well as everything that everyone else has already said, um, I think we need to understand more about the economics and, and the social science, the consumer behaviours. There are a lot of really good ideas out there and some of them have been around for a while. And I think where we really need to understand, where we need to research more is how do we make these things commercially viable? How do we ensure that these things um, are that all important third component of sustainability financially viable? We're good on, we're pretty good on environmental stuff, not bad on social stuff, got to make them financially viable or they'll never happen. Okay, that's great. Um, we're now into the to the last minute, and I just want to say a, a huge thank you to our panelists. I think we've got so many questions we could continue for another hour, probably quite easily, but unfortunately we um, we don't have that that time. So I want to thank all of you. I want to thank all of the participants for joining us, um, for sharing those questions. Um, I'm sure that we have a plan. Um, I will check in with the events team around how we can respond to some of those questions we haven't had time um, to cover, um, because I think there is clearly a lot of interest in this and um, a fantastic way to actually to kick off our net zero um, webinar series so again thank you all very much for your time and and I for one I'm really excited to to to, to track to understand the next steps and the outcomes um, as you progress through your project so thank you all very much and uh, we have to give a round of applause thank you thank you everyone thank you all bye bye yes.